It's good to be here. My name is Dave. I'm the Children and Families Pastor here at Cary, and uh, now I'm really nervous about this, so I'm going to put the lid back on and just do the message without drinking water. Welcome to our family service. We call these family services because this is the time that we get to celebrate when we have our Splash Zone kids and adults all together that Jesus brings us all together and makes us family. Whether you are young or old, whether you are married or single, whether you have kids or you don't, we are all invited to be part of the family of God. And, and that is something that is worth celebrating. and something that we're celebrating today. This morning, we are kicking off a brand new theme called Romans. And it's all about Romans Yes, good guess, good guess. Now, Splash Zone Kids, we've been doing a theme called Deep Dive, and we've been talking about diving deep into the Word of God, and we're going to be resuming that next week. But today, we're going to put some of the stuff that we've learned into practice and dive deep into the book of Romans. So, listen up, lean in, and I know that you're going to get something out of it. God is going to speak to us through his word, just as Pete said earlier this morning. So why don't we just take a moment to pray and invite God to do exactly that. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that you are good and that you are here. Thank you, Lord, that you long to speak to us and change us and transform us. Would you speak to us this morning through your word in Jesus' name? Amen. So the book of Romans is a letter. It's a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. And uh, Paul likely wrote this letter to be his most complete explanation of the gospel for a few for a few reasons. Now, when I say the gospel, I'm talking about the story of Jesus and particularly his death and resurrection to save the world from sin. For a few reasons, Paul really goes in depth in the book of Romans. He the church in Rome was made up of a lot of different Christians from different backgrounds. Many were Jewish and became Christian, and many were of, uh, from other backgrounds and also became Christians. And so it was really important to Paul to get them all on the same page, to get everybody in that church united around the, the same truth. He also wanted them to support him as he, as he took the gospel even further throughout the world. And so it was really important that they had a good, clear understanding of what his beliefs actually were so that they could support him. And that's really good news for us because it means that we get access to a really in-depth, complete explanation of the gospel. It's also, though, a little bit sometimes... Uh, Sometimes reading the book of Romans is a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. It's just like there is so much. There is so much in it. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the first five chapters over the next ten weeks. And we'll probably scratch the surface a little bit. Today we're just going to be looking at the first half of chapter one, which I think of as like the little... Um, the little intro bit, like when you're watching a YouTube video and there's that first little bit, the first few seconds where they give you that like, the, just enough interesting thing so that you will watch the rest of the video. It's probably, it's the bit that comes just before this video was brought to us by Audible, you know? That first little bit, that's what this, this little, um, this first half of Romans 1 is. Paul's introduction. And so if you've got your Bibles, turn to Romans 1. It'd be good to have it out in front of you as we talk through it. Paul begins by introducing himself and saying that he is all about the gospel. He's all about this message of Jesus and spreading it throughout the world. Uh, and, he, and he mentions that the, the gospel is this message of Jesus, his death and resurrection, and importantly, that it was promised by God through the prophets and was fulfilled. And we'll come back to that in a minute. He goes on to greet the church in Rome. He greets the Roman Christians. He encourages their faith. Uh, and he says that he wants to come and see them. And then he, he gets to verse 16. Verse 16 and 17 are kind of like that most important little, little bit that gets you to want to read the rest of the... It tells you what he's, gonna, what he's, what he's talking about that's that he's then going to spend the rest of the book of Romans digging into. This is like his, his thesis statement, verse 16 and 17. We're going to spend most of our time here this morning, because this, is, I think, is the most important bit to understand. 
Let's read it together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, some of you, when I, when I read that couple of verses, you heard that and you were like, mm, yeah, that is juice. That is a juicy scripture. There is meat there. And others of you heard it and said, what? What? What the heck did any of that mean? There was... Mm, it can be tricky. It can be a little bit tricky to understand, particularly when there's words in there that we don't usually use, but that have really deep meaning. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the word righteousness, because Paul uses this word a few times. Um, he uses it three times in one verse, and it's important that we understand it, but we don't really use the word righteous outside of talking about the Bible, do we? So what, is, what does it mean well, a dictionary definition of righteousness would be the quality of being right, just being right. But I think when we're talking about God's righteousness, it's about more than just that. It's more than the fact that God is right all the time. We know that God's right all the time. He, he knows stuff. He knows all the things, and he has the answers, but it's more than that. Everything about God is right. Everything about God is the way that it should be. And there's so much in this, I just want to give you three words this morning that I think might help us to have a starting point of understanding God's righteousness and what it means. First of all, God is good. When we talk about God's righteousness, we're, we're talking about God being good. He is good. There is nothing about him that is bad. But more than God's goodness, God is also just God is just. God does not let evil go unpunished. God stands up and fights for the weak and the oppressed. And so when we reflect on God's righteousness, we're thinking about his justice. And we're also, we're also saying that God is faithful. God can be trusted. God keeps his promises. And God's faithfulness is another part of his righteousness. And there's probably so much more in God's righteousness, but uh, and we could probably talk about it all day, but we're going we're gonna to go with those three things. I want to encourage you to just think of those three things as we talk about righteousness. God is good, God is just, and God is faithful. So then Paul, Paul says that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. In other words, when we look at the death and resurrection of Jesus, we see just how good and just and righteous and faithful God is. And then Paul calls it a righteousness that is by faith. And I found that a little bit confusing. I started to wonder, what, is that, what does that mean? Does that mean that how can God's righteousness be affected by faith? Does it mean that our faith affects how righteous God is? No. God's righteousness doesn't change. He is good. He is just. He is faithful. And nothing can change that about him. Um, but I think that what it means is that our faith determines how much God's righteousness affects us. It's a little bit like ice cream. I love ice cream. Oh, yes, thank you. I'll, I'll do it later, but I love ice cream. Does anyone love ice cream? Yes, it's so good. Now, I want you to imagine that, that somebody invents the best ice cream in the world, the best flavor of ice cream that's just like everyone in the world would agree, this is the greatest tasting ice cream of all time. And it's sitting here, I mean, this, yeah, if cookies and cream is your favorite, then you can see it, but imagine that it's sitting here in this container, the world's greatest ice cream. And are you enjoying it? Not really, right? Because the, the ice cream could be the greatest ice cream in the world, but it will affect you in no way unless you do what? You eat it, right, unless you taste it. It's kind of like God and God's righteousness is the ice cream, and our faith is the spoon. God, God 
God is good and just and faithful, but un- unless we believe that, unless we have faith, unless we allow him to affect us, his righteousness can mean nothing to us. But when we have faith that God is like that, then his righteousness begins to affect us too. How does it affect us? Well, Paul's answer, I think, is in the, the last bit of verse 17. The righteous will live by faith. The more faith that we have in God's righteousness, the more it, it changes us and we start living by it and we become more good and more just and more faithful. 2 Corinthians 3 says this, But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. As we have faith in the righteousness of God, we are made more like Jesus. As we focus on God's goodness and justice and faithfulness, those things become more a part of who we are as well. But there's a part that's, that's missing from all this, I think. See, we can, we can believe all of these things and still not be affected by the righteousness of God if we don't believe that he can and wants to change us. Why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we believe that? Well, sometimes I think that we, we don't think that he would want to. I fall into this trap all the time. All the time, I'll I'll find myself thinking, I'm too insignificant for God to waste his time working on changing, transforming me. Why would why would God do that for somebody so unimportant? It's it's so easy to fall into that trap. And if that's if you've ever thought that thought, if you've ever felt that way also, then let me just direct us back to verse 16, where Paul says. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. It's not not some people, not not a few, everyone who believes. This is a message that is for everyone, and this is an invitation that is for everyone. No one is too insignificant for the love and the righteousness of God. A lot of us sometimes don't get even that far, though. Sometimes we get stuck in this this previous thought when we we get stuck on this idea that Jesus is perfect and and I'm broken and and I'll fail. And both of those things are true. Jesus is perfect and we are broken. But when we get stuck there, when we get stuck there, then what happens is knowing that I can fail becomes I will definitely always fail. And Instead of aiming to obey God, we start making what what seem like more more humble or more reasonable demands, uh, demands, um, goals, more reasonable goals. It's kind of like if I held up this target. Now, I've got some tape. So, bear with me. There we go. We have a target. No one shoot me. But like with with a target, like with with archery or shooting at a target, if you if you aim at the outer circle because it's bigger, then you might hit it. But when you miss, you're more likely to miss miss properly. What they recommend is that when you're trying to hit a bullseye that you, you f- find the smallest possible center of the bullseye to fix, to, to fix your aim on, and then even when you miss that, you're still more likely to do pretty well. I heard one, one uh, archer talking about the idea that he loves it when 
uh, somebody else hits the bullseye first because then he's got an even more narrow thing to aim at. He can just aim at the other guy's arrow and he's more likely to do really well. The problem is that sometimes we, we, we see Jesus as the bullseye and we say, well, I can't, I can't live like that. I can't follow Jesus' example. He's too high above me. I'm going to fail. I'll just, I'll just aim for the outer circle. I'll just try and figure out a more realistic goal. It might, be, it might sound something like this. It might sound like, look, I can't cut lying out of my life. It's too hard. Maybe I'll just, I still have to lie to my parents, but I'll just stop lying to my friend. How about that, Right? We, it's, like, it's like aiming for the edge instead of the bullseye. And the problem is that then when you miss, the consequences are going to be worse. More importantly probably than that is this. 1 John 3 says this about it. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin, but anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. When we try to figure out a, a more realistic goal, then that's something that's lower and, and not as, that doesn't stretch us as much as trying to follow Jesus, then this passage tells us that when we do that, we are choosing to keep sinning. And when we choose to keep sinning, even if we say, you know what, I'll just sin on the weekend, then it's at least less than every day. Any time that we're choosing to keep sinning, we miss who Jesus really is. So how do we break out of this mindset? Well, Paul tells us that the righteous will live by faith. So don't aim for a, a human level of righteousness. Don't aim for a level of righteousness that it's like, oh, this seems reasonable to me. No, aim for Jesus. It's not blasphemy to say, I am aiming to live a sinless life like Jesus. I'm aiming to do that by his grace because I have the faith that he can change me. He can transform me. He can empower me to do that. We are changed into his glorious image. Look at the righteousness of Jesus and have faith that he can and he will call you up to his level. In Romans 1 verse 5, Paul tells us that we are called to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. This spun me out a little bit. Obedience comes from faith. I always thought obedience came from me trying really, really hard to obey. But here he tells us, no, obedience doesn't come from our own efforts and energy. Obedience comes from faith. It comes from faith that God is good. It comes from faith that God is just. Faith that God is faithful. And as we have faith in those things, those things are revealed in us. And they will be revealed in us in the way that they transform us and how we live. And then we become the ones God calls righteous. We become the righteous who are living by faith. So if, you've, if you ever need a reminder of what the righteousness of God looks like, let me just direct you back to the cross because this is where it was always best revealed. Jesus died willingly on the cross. He took the punishment that our brokenness deserved. He rose from the dead, conquering sin and death, just as God promised through the prophets, showing us his goodness, his justice, his faithfulness. This is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Church, I'd love to pray with you this morning. Can I invite everyone to close your eyes and bow your heads with me? And there's a couple of things I want to pray for. First of all, if this morning, if you've, as I've been talking about God's righteousness and us being transformed, if that's something that resonated with you and you're thinking, yes, I, I do want to be made right. I do need to be made right. I need to be changed. I need to be transformed. Then I would love to, I would love to pray for you. Maybe you, um, maybe you haven't been believing that God 
can change you. Maybe you haven't been believing that he wants to. Well, he loves you. And let me tell you this morning, he can. It is within his power and he loves you and he wants to bring you up. If that's you, I encourage you, just let God know right now. Just say, God, that's me. And maybe, maybe you don't know God. Maybe you feel like you've never connected with God, but the God that I've been describing, someone who is good and just and faithful and who loves you and wants to transform you, maybe that is someone that you're thinking now, actually, I would like to get to know that God. If that's who God is, then I want to get to know Him. Connecting with God is as simple as saying, God, I need your help. I believe that Jesus died and rose again. And I invite you into my heart. And if that's something that you want to do this morning that you've never said to God before, then I encourage you, say it to God right now. Just say, God, that's me. I need you. I believe. And I ask you to be my Savior. I'm going to...